message is, according to the church calendar, from Acts 9, one of the three passages dedicated to this day. Acts 9, the start of the church. It's witnessing for Christ, but it's also connected to April 24th. I'm going to explain in a minute. It starts with this. Paul remained with the disciples in Damascus. Immediately he began to preach Jesus in the synagogues. And the point of his teaching was, this is the Son of God. I'm going to repeat that. The point of his teaching was to say to everybody, this is the Son of God, Jesus, right? So every year at this time, we commemorate the most important time for the ministry of Christ, the post-resurrection period. I remind everybody every year, this is my favorite season in the church calendar. Important because his work is complete. He did why, what he needed to do while he was here. He's handing the church over to us. Now it's in our hands. Question, what are we going to do about it? Church is in our hands. Now what? Well, this week we also commemorate the anniversary of the Armenian Genocide, right? Same question. What are we going to do about it? So it's in our hands. We're the living generation now. Ironically, we commemorate both events, Easter and the Genocide Commemoration. In the month we call April, in April we call in Armenian, Abril. Abril is our verb to live in Armenian, Abril, to live. Gabrim, Gabris, Gabri. It's even more ironic that today's passage I just read deals with the early days of the church practically points to what we commemorate on April 24. It's the account of what happened to Paul following his conversion on the road to Damascus. Once he got to Damascus, he immediately, without hesitation and doubt, began to witness, not as a noun, as a verb. There's a difference. He began to witness the good news of what he encountered, and he did it in the synagogues. Why is that so important? Why is that so courageous that he spread the news of Jesus in the synagogues? Because he was known as being a persecutor of this Jesus sect. Suddenly he shows up, not just defending the message of Jesus, but actually preaching the message of Jesus. So it didn't take long for the Jews, who thought this Jesus cult was a total aberration of Judaism, didn't take them long to turn against Paul. The passage continues, Acts 9. After some time, the Jews formed a plot to murder him. But Paul found out, he was informed, Night and day they watched to murder him, but the disciples took him at night for protection. What was Paul's crime? He not only had faith in Christ, but he preached it with vigor. That was his crime. And what happened? They plotted against him. They chased after him. They tried to kill him. But he escaped by the skin of his teeth this time. What do we learn from it? Well, clearly... If anyone is going to demonstrate loyalty to Christ, it's not going to be easy. I'm going to repeat that. The lesson to Paul is a lesson to us. If anyone is going to demonstrate loyalty to Christ, it is not going to be easy. In those days, they were dealing with the Roman government and the Jewish authorities. In these days, we're dealing with Hollywood. The enemies of Christ, the people that hate Christ, the people that hate a faith system. Anything that points to taking responsibility for a moral code instead of a legal code. If you think about it, that's part of what we commemorate every April 24th. The fact that half of our forefathers were martyred in 1915 is a testament to what St. Paul learned in Damascus. If anyone is going to demonstrate loyalty to Christ, it's not gonna be easy. I'll say it again. If anyone is going to demonstrate loyalty to Christ, it's not going to be easy. St. Paul was almost killed because he identified himself as a follower of Christ. In 1915, a million and a half of our forefathers, in fact, were killed for the same reason. They identified themselves as followers of Christ. Look, from the moment Thaddeus and Bartholomew brought the light of Christ to Armenia, right, after the resurrection, it's been nothing but challenge after bloody challenge. We know our history. We know what happened until Durtad decreed Christianity legal in 301. 
We know the misery of Vartanans in 451. The intolerance against Christian Armenians is exactly the same intolerance Paul encountered in Damascus. Does anyone really think that if Armenians in Anatolia were Muslim and not Christian, there would still have been a genocide? Let's get real. The parallels of the challenges presented by Christianity to both the Roman pagan world and the Armenian world are incredible, the parallels. Rome saw Christians as a threat to civil order. Jewish leaders saw Christians as a threat to religious order. And there was a repeat in 1915. Ottoman Turks saw Christian Armenians as a threat to their political order and an insult to their religious order. Anyone living in the Roman Jewish world who dared to call himself a Christian was subject to unspeakable punishment. It wasn't going to be easy. Same goes for the Christian Armenian community in Anatolia in the last century. What was the crime of St. Paul? What was he doing that was so wrong? It started with the fact that he proclaimed himself a follower of Christ. What was the crime of the Armenians in Anatolia 105 years ago? It started with the fact that they proclaimed themselves as followers of Christ. And we know this because of eyewitness accounts of the survivors, that the now sainted victims were given the opportunity to save themselves if they did what? Denied Christ and converted. I don't think you can count on one hand the number of people that did that. And immediately following the resurrection, the punishment for following Jesus was what? Martyrdom by crucifixion, right? Or martyrdom by being stoned to death, like St. Stephen, a proto-martyr, the first martyr. The crime for following Jesus in 1915 was what? Martyrdom again, but by genocide. In either case, the message is the same. No one said being a Christian was going to be easy. Nobody. So, Father Saki sat was then, we're here now in 2020. What should our reaction be? Well, for one thing, it's not right to simply stand back and say how proud we are to be the first Christian nation. It's not right to simply stand back and say how proud we are that we kept our faith through Vartanans. It's not right to simply stand back and say how proud we are that 100 years ago, our forefathers kept their faith through the genocide. If we do that, we're guilty of plagiarism because none of us were alive in 301 or 451 or 1915. That's taking the credit for the work of other people. Think about it. This generation, me and up, <clears throat> we're the last generation <clears throat> to know the eyewitnesses of the genocide or the survivors of the genocide. We are the last eyewitnesses of the eyewitnesses. So what are we going to do about it? It's not enough to say we're proud. It's not enough to do that. We got to walk the walk. We have to keep the faith. If we drop the faith after they kept it even to the point of death, what does that say about us and our character? If we want to be proud and do justice to our forefathers, we got to walk the walk. I'm tired of doing gerta tawums. I'm going off the script. You know what a gerta tahum is? I made up that word. Gertastan tahum. Gertastan is the dynasty, the family dynasty. Tahum is the funeral, it's the burial. I'm doing grandpa's funeral, but I see his children, grandchildren, sometimes great-grandchildren, that have absolutely no connection to the faith of the Armenian church or the Armenian people. Heratsads. I know it's the last time I'm going to see those children and grandchildren in this church at grandpa's funeral. That's a gerta tarum. I'm burying grandpa physically at the cemetery. I might as well be burying everybody else. They're dead to Christ, dead to God. And then at the hockey josh, oh, this is delicious kufte. What the Turks started 100 years ago, sometimes I watch it's finishing today. Separate an Armenian from the Armenian church and they succeed. If we want to be proud and do justice to our forefathers, then we can't take the credit for their work. In our own right, we have to stand up with faith and proclaim it as much as Paul did in Damascus, as much as Krikorusavorish did in the 
face of Chorvi Rab in 301, as much as Vartan did in Avaratash, as much as the sainted genocide martyrs did in 1915, if we want to be proud and do justice to our forefathers, then we can't hide behind their martyrdom and take credit for their work. In our own right, we have to stand up with unbridled courage and proclaim loud and clear for everyone to hear, Christos Haryavi Merelots, Ortnyale Harachunen Christosi. Amen.